Understanding people. My dad wrote this book in 1986, my senior year in high school. It was published in 1987. And some of you know that uh, I challenged my parents for a few years, my senior year in high school, as well as in some of the college years. And I usually say that I, I'm largely responsible for my character, parents' character development during those times. But um, many of you know that I have been unquestionably kind of the problem child in the Crab family. So I think his dad was writing this book, Understanding People, he was thinking about, <laughs> about me and how to understand me a little bit. So it was exciting going through this. But for the last few weeks, I've had a chance to go through this book, and I've come to realize that this really was a foundational, pivotal book to where dad was and to where he was going with his thinking of counseling and spiritual direction. And, and Crab was often misunderstood. He was seen sometimes as an anti-counseling person, and that was just absolutely not true. Um, provided the counseling was being done in a way that was getting to the issues, getting to what was really going on. Um, or he was seen as someone who was just kind of so far ahead of us. And, you know, we're just all trying to play catch up. But in this book, much like most crab books, he begins with a series of questions. He says, what does it mean to claim that the particular approach to counseling is biblical? His question was, what makes a Christian counselor Christian? He used to ask that all the time. Second question was, how do we understand the relationship between biblical study and psychological inquiry. The third question is how do spiritual leaders in the church and trained counselors in their professional world work together to help people become emotionally whole and relationally effective? I used to love the way he would write, relationally effective, wow. And what should we do with the tired but still very alive issue of self-esteem? These were some of the, the, the questions that he's answering in this book, there was one, one paragraph that grabbed me at the beginning of the book that I want to read to you real quickly. Just a quick three-sentence par three paragraph. But in this paragraph, he actually talks about four titles of books that he will later produce in his life. And then in the last sentence of this paragraph, he talks about what his favorite topic was uh, for probably the last 15 years of his life, is what it means to have a conversation that matters. He talked about that all the time. It's fun to look back years and years ago, 35 years ago, and see how these thoughts were still formulating. But he says this, he says, how about Larry Crabb? He asks himself, does he really believe what his more recent books suggest that soul talk can connect people to a true spiritual community that takes the pressure off people to release gospel power into their lives? <laughs> Four titles. And then he goes on to say in the last sentence, he says here, can well-meaning Christians be equipped to have conversations that matter. He loves talking about that. Mm -hmm. Conversations that can better achieve what we wrongly assume can only happen in therapy. Dad always put scripture above psychology. And the, the understanding people and the book understanding people, the center of this book, really, he puts scripture in, in spending time in your word. My dad um, much like his father, was always in the word. And he told me once, he told me this story year, years and years ago. He said, Kep, I have to read the word like I have to eat and like I have to breathe. <laughs> hmm. um, and I didn't understand that at the time, but I'm starting to understand it now. But dad starts to unpack a lot of things in this book, but he really starts to talk about counseling and Christian counseling and what he called biblical counseling. The title of his first two books, Basic principles of biblical counseling. The second book, Effective Principles of Biblical Counseling. What does it mean to be a biblical counselor? Well, before I introduce our guest today, he talks about what it means to be a biblical counselor, and he lays out three guidelines to what he calls are kind of the guidelines for biblical counsel. And I think these are really, really important thoughts for us to have today as we dialogue with people, because it seems like that's not happening very well today in some ways. So these are the three guidelines that Crab talks about being biblical in your counseling. The first one is articulate our positions carefully and non-defensively. Demonstrate with consistency with demonstrate their consistency with scripture with non-antagonistic fervor that matches our convictions about their validity and usefulness. Where conviction is tentative, fervor should be subdued. Significant self-examination to our motives will be required to follow this first guideline. That's guideline one. The second guideline is maintain a willing openness to changing positions we currently cherish. If we come to believe that change is warranted, 
by previously unseen insights into scripture. Dad, especially when he was writing the book 66 Love Letters, consulted theologians and so many people to make sure he was interpreting and handling the scriptures well. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing was a guideline. Uh, the, last, the third guideline is self-consciously labor to walk the tightrope of open conviction by working to avoid falling into either of these two categories. And I think we both, both fall into these mm -hmm. sometimes is accommodationism. What that means is openness to the point where unity is placed above truth. That happens all the time. I see it today. And the second one, exclusivism. And this one, I think, is all over the place. Conviction to the point where condemnation of another viewpoint precedes even understanding that viewpoint. Dad finishes this by saying this, and, and this is something I hope we can all take away from today, is we should agree when we can agree, disagree when we must, and cooperate whenever possible without compromising the pursuit of godly purposes. Mm. So those are kind of some interesting things today. And, and you know, it's just, uh, it's exciting here. I've got a friend of mine joining us today, Evan Lowe. Evan Lowe is a, uh, the father of five, a husband for uh, three decades, and a person who I met about, um, what was it? I guess early March we met, Evan, for March, the first yeah. time. And uh, I've gotten to know each other a little bit that way. And um, when we were chatting, you had mentioned that Understanding People was a book that was very impacting in your life. And I just want to kind of unpack some of that now. So thanks for joining me today, bro. Sure. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess kind of the big question I have as we dive in here is what was so impacting about this book to you? You know, as we were recollecting when it was written and when it was published, um, it brought me back to where was I at, the, at that time? Um, and asking a lot of questions, not getting a lot of answers. And my girlfriend at the time was going to get a master's in counseling. She'd grown up in an Orthodox Protestant denomination and was going to go to the seminary that was appropriate with that. And the last minute she switched to go to Grace Seminary where your dad was teaching at the time. Mm -hmm. Growing up the way I did, I realized I had a very dysfunctional relationship with my dad that we could talk for days about. Um, but I was, I was drawn to think, how do I struggle well through that? How do I understand the layers inside me um, and, uh, and to make sense out of it, quite frankly? And none, I read and read and read. I, I listened, I listened, listened. And when I, when, I, when I started sneaking up to the seminary when I was still undergrad and sitting in these classes and realizing I need to delve backwards a little bit to understand myself. It informs me, but it doesn't define me. Mm. And that was a key thing. I wasn't even allowing it to inform me. I've been allowing myself to go back and say, these are things that have happened. It makes sense, but the gospel is what defines you. And walking that tightrope of being fully defined most foundationally by the gospel, not by the hurts and misunderstandings and the, and the, the brokenness of this world, quite frankly, it's all over. And, um, that tightrope, as you described earlier, is was a discussion that happened in 1987. That's when my wife started going to school, mm -hmm. and it's not stopped since then. And so it allowed me to go back and look honestly um, and not place blame, but make understanding and make sense out of it, but then hang on more deeply to the gospel. Yeah. As you've read this book, and I know it brought back a lot of things, and, um, you know, I know as we've been thinking about having this conversation today, tell me how this, this, this book has, has not just impacted you like you did there, sure. but how has it changed you? I think one of the questions that my dad always asked and one of his favorite questions um, of the, the many that he loved, but mm -hmm. what creates real change in a person? How do you get someone to really change? And I'm going this way and now I'm going this way. And, and that's really the whole essence of, of the gospel is how do you, how do you have that 180 life changing opportunity there? And, um, and so what, what's changed in you, Evan, since, since you've been thinking through some of these sure. thoughts that dad kind of unpacked here as we're, you know, is, you know, this book is really foundational. I remember some of the, you know, I was young back then I was 20, whatever I was. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, hold on. All young back I, was a, I was a freshman or sophomore in college, but, um, right. As soon as I delved into this space of counseling and psychology, which I did, I knew very little about. It was a it was a great debate. Um, I, so I think the book was foundational. It's really foundational for me to um, 
make sense out of what the desires, the longings I had, the things that were going on inside me. How do I make sense out of this in terms of the brokenness and uh, the deepest longings inside me that were grown out of being adopted as a son, right? I have longings that I can't fill. Mm -hmm. And that was a game changer for me. Yeah. Um, I remember having a discussion of needs and desires in another book he read about marriage builder and coming, coming to understanding um, what do I really need to make it through on this planet? What do I desire? And uh, I used to crush the desires thinking, well, I'll never get those. But he says, no, groan for those desires. Know that. And so he gave me permission to do that. That book really gave me permission to see that. Yeah, that is so important. Uh, and I think one of the things that dad really does do is he, he gives us permission to go into areas that we didn't want to go into. Mm -hmm. A lot of the questions that he's asking seem to be questions that you don't want to explore. So oftentimes nowadays, um, we don't want to dive into those kind of things, it seems. And even today, what, what I was kind of taken with as I was going through this book is how relevant it is today right. and how spot on it, you know, even what we talked about of just having a dialogue with someone, agree when we can agree and we must disagree when we must agree. But if we can do everything for the purpose of God as we're moving forward, Right. Um, and that's just seems to be being lost in some ways. And so, um, you know, I, I just, I just think as I've looked at this book and, and as I've, you know, kind of even had a chance to walk with you, understanding you a little bit more, um, you know, we, we spoke the other day, you talked about how, um, you know, how you tend to, to be a little bit of an angry guy sometimes. Do you think that this book has impacted that in some ways? Sure. You know, the, this, the cynicism, the anger, looking around, it's hard not to be, um, cause it's not what it was meant to be. Um, going back and understanding my fundamental design of who God is and who I am, how do I interact with him? How do I understand sin in the context of a, an Orthodox view, but yet it not define you because of what the cross did and yet being dragged back, back and forth in lacking of hope and being cynical and so i think that one of the things this book really reminded me back was there's a deep hope um and it helped it's helping i should say in real time to chip away at my cynicism i used to say that cynicism is seeing things accurately but without hope and my son who's now growing up he's 22 going to seminary this fall said dad that's that's wrong it's uh cynicism is not understanding the gospel and the most fundamental part of the gospel of who we are gets, gets complicated because we're layered people, we're complicated people, our pastor are complicated, but I need to own the gospel. And it was a challenge to me to say, this is the most fundamental place of who I am with the Lord. And you, your cynicism doesn't go away, but it starts melting because the more you focus on that, the less you focus on what's wrong. How do you know that the direction you're going right now is the right direction, Evan? How do you know you're on the right track? <laughs> What time? What day is it? Um, we, we don't you know, have a whole I, lot I can, of time, I can but tell I tell you, um, my wife has a little term for me. You probably remember the little weevils, you know, little kids' toys, weevils wobble, they don't fall down. You know, why do I know I'm on the right track? Um, I, I didn't read the word, and I don't read it probably as much in passion as your dad did. You but, did. I, it, but I love it. Yeah, I, I, I have to go back to it and say, does this make sense? Lord, what are you doing here? What did you promise? I hope for a lot of promises and desires, but you never laid that out. And reconciling truly what the promises are, are deeply hopeful and not necessarily short-term temporary. And that, that, that reminder back from Hebrews, back through the Old Testament Deuteronomy with, this, with the uh, Israelites realizing he was taking us somewhere. He was letting us know our heart. Um, he wanted to expose it so he could warm it up and make us more like Christ. And um, our hearts are scary. And for me, I didn't understand it. I was scared of myself and I realized, no, you're redeemed. And that's a place of hope. And so that, I come back to that hope. And honestly, uh, I could give you a whole lot of other reasons, except the Holy Spirit reminds me of that truth of my adoption. Often. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when you talk about how do you know you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, one of the questions I used to ask dad all the time is how do you know when the spirit's really speaking to you? Mm -hmm. And he, um, his answer was interesting. He said, when you, when you see it in scripture, when you hear it in community, yep. and when you feel it in your soul. 
Yeah. Yeah. Those three line up. You're probably there. He talks about the four roads to knowing intuition, reason, experience, but none of them mean anything without revelation. You know, and I think one of the pieces that I take away from this too, as you and I are having this conversation even now, is the categories of problems. He defines defines problems into two categories, and I think this is really really special for me because it it's kind of identified some things. But the first one is obviously the physical, you know, the natural causes. I mean, you know, when you have a problem and you've got cancer, you've got a serious problem. And I'm not sure how Scripture deals with that specifically, but in categories, it does deal with that, and how you deal with it. I said even to Kimmy when she went through when we've gone through her deal is we were going in two years ago on September 8th for her surgery. I said, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know that God's already taken care of your biggest problem. Yeah. And that's the second thing is, 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 is problems resulting from moral causes. And I think this was really the beginning of dad when he started to talk about the seven questions. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I mean, when he starts talking about these whole categories of understanding and personal, emotional and relational and volitional and all these different ways that we relate and interact what what's what stood out to you the most, Evan, as as um as you were reading through some of this stuff in terms of how you talk to people hmm. because of this? Well, uh, that that's a great question because uh, I think I remember your dad saying once uh, most people show up and throw up. You need to show up and shut up, right? And so as you engage another person's soul, um, you got to know your own soul, right? At some level, you can't go somewhere where you've never been yourself in terms of walking with the Lord in revealing things, um, but it created an opportunity. You know, I, I think what one of the things this book and the other things have spurred me on is there's an opportunity to connect with another human being, another image bearer, another soul bearing person. And so every conversation does matter. Yes. Um, and the term he often used somewhere uh, from somebody it was transcendently curious. So when you engage another human being, it's not just who won the Super Bowl, who won the game last night, though that is interesting to me on some of the Ohio State games. Can, Easy now. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but Lord's up to something yeah, all the time. And we don't see it very often from our own mirror. And just being an encourager and being reminding and say, I'm wondering what he's up to in your life. Yeah. And then having the discernment to help us navigate our own self-obsession, our own clouded thinking, our own stuff, right? And that's the part of the community your dad really encouraged and supported was mirroring back, right? Both encouragement and exhortation, whatever it might be. See, do you see what God's doing? First of all, it's a good thing. It's a great story. It is part of the larger story. Yes. Can't wait to get to the party, right? That is the imagery I have. And that was formed through a largely part of your dad is seeing the Trinity and saying, here's my brother who's, he's invited to the same party I am, right? And uh, how, do I, how do I remind him of his position? Getting his position straight will help refocus all the other challenges that are being thrown at us. So it's those kind of things that really stirred me, quite frankly, to the point of I wanted to build and learn how to develop a community that had meaningful conversations. Yeah, that is that is something that he even talks about that we all long for. Mm -hmm. Why is the worst punishment that you can inflict on somebody is isolation? Right. Because we're all meant for community. We're all meant for relationship. And what does it mean to have, you know, if, if you if you had to define my dad in one word, you know, the word would be, and I don't know if this is a hyphenated word, but godly relationship. What does it mean to have relationships that are reflective of, of Jesus, the Father, and the Trinity? And that's that's how he always he always was. I, I one thing that really kind of hit me too as you're talking, it says um, he, he had a quote in there: if careful attention is not given to our internal world our internal review. He always talked about what's going on in your internal world, Dad. It, he says, then that's external improvements are sheer hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. um, and he went then from there into what does it look like when we have these relational pains that are going on that now direct how we strategize our relationships. And he's, you know, the one thing I noticed in this book, Evan, and you might've noticed it too, you've read a bunch of crab books um, and I have in the in the past, and I think people might be getting tired of me saying, I think this is a foundational crab book, because I think I've said that about all of them so far. But this one, being that it's so old, I'm seeing it differently than I've seen all of them. Maybe a little bit similarly to connecting that we did last month, because that was kind of in the same timetable to some degree just a few years later. But, but this book really has opened up so much to me because uh, he uses all those graphics and, and different, different ways of thinking, and, and he uses the word opportunity. Confusion is an opportunity to trust. 
Right. Um, attending to our destructive emotions can lead us to new dimensions of repentance. That one just like pierced my soul. Mm. Um, my destructive emotions, which I have in me, I, I fire off. I'm, I'm quick to defend. Um, I'm quick to attack. Mm. But then I always want to, that's where I just have to cling to the cross and say, man, do I need, need your grace, Lord, and your mercy. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I came away with it. One of the yeah. things that, that took me to, and, I, and I'll let you, let you say some things, man, sorry, but is I think dad might change a few things in this book if you were to write it today. Mm. Is, um, is as I was going through that, I was just kind of thinking through, what does that look like? And I think the word maturity is one that he would probably start to redefine a little bit just a little bit. And I'm not saying major changes, but I don't think he would ever use the word mature anymore. He would always use the word maturing, perhaps. <laughs> when he, when my grandfather was 86 years old, I asked him, I asked my grandpa, my grandpa a question. Uh, um, and I said, grandpa, do you think that you're mature? And he's an 86 year old man. And he looked like I, he got very, jittery and thought, no, no, I, I'm not mature. And it made me think, and even today is how this life continues to be a struggle and even more of a struggle all the way to the end. And it's a continual journey until we finish. And how do we finish well is what I think needs to be the focus. And how do we finish this life well as we're maturing on the narrow road? Because we never fully mature. I would say dad would say that today. Um, he talks a lot in part three of this book about maturity. How do you think you've changed just over the years because of your willingness to be open? You know, I was thinking through something you said earlier about um, emotions. I think two other things your dad helped give me permission, at least, was to, and it was at the end of the book, to he discussed it again. Um, pay attention to your emotions. Like, um, like, don't be defined by them, but pay attention. That, that's a red light on your dashboard saying, hey, pay attention. And I grew up in a place where uh, there's a lot of pain in my life growing up. Um, so I put my shoulder down, played linebacker and fullback and ran marathons, right? I, I, I just absorbed it. I thought the week didn't pay attention to those things because I saw everyone being defined and whipsawed by their emotions. But they are a dashboard light. So getting, get, paying attention and gave me some grace. I understood that this is telling me something that's going on inside me, but you know, in terms of um, change, <laughs> he has also given me permission to recognize that the, the longer you journey, the more you're going to see, and the more you're going to see, the more overwhelmed you might be, unless you have a perspective that says um, there's a transformation thing going on here. And the more you grow closer to Christ, the more you're going to see you're not like Christ. And that's why probably your grandfather and your dad. Uh, would say maturing. I'm not mature. There's no the destination. I, I'm in process, and yeah. it can be really discouraging. Quite frankly, when you when you see it, you just, you think, man, was uh, the, uh, dark night of the soul and me the only you know is this the only couple of us struggling here, or, or is this part of the maturing process? Is like seeing, but being hopeful, like not being defined by your sin, and that's the freedom that you get from understanding that. So I think he's given me permission to that, and it's taken a lot of pressure to say, wow. I am, I am a high functioning train wreck and people meet me to get to know me. I get a lot of stuff done, but um, as I grow my walk, I just realize I don't have to be somewhere. The destination is the process of submitting yourself. And, you know, he summed it all up in the, in one of the last chapters saying, what comes out of you is love, right? At the end of the day, do you love? And you're going to know if you love more deeply internally, what are those reactions going on inside? Because we can put a lot of fancy faces on and a whole lot of hugs and kisses and, uh, your dad talked about dancing and stepping on toes. I think a lot of us Christians have stepped back into country line dancing. Lots of fun, but no toes are getting stepped on, right? And so wow, he allowed me to deal with that and acknowledge that and not be discouraged by it. Yeah. I think that's such a good point because it's so easy to get discouraged mm. as the journey continues. And I think that in the maturing process on the narrow road, our faith and our hope are deepened in ways that allow you to finish well, perhaps. And that's mm -hmm. how Paul and all of those guys, that was their, their desire was to finish well. We got a chance to see that in dad. Mm -hmm. um, and I love saying that he's no longer living with any faith and he's no longer living with any hope. 
Mm -hmm. He's living with a ton of love because he's living in the presence of Jesus. And so, you know, when faith and hope end, man, love keeps going. And that's it. What did he leave us? He left us a lot of words, left us a lot of thoughts, but he left us his love. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think I missed the most from him for sure. And um, I just think this book has the opportunity to, again, be very foundational in how you start to talk with people in a way that brings out the spirit guidance during these conversations. And that's what I know we long to have as we have these conversations. You and I've got a conversation coming up later today that I'm hoping that the spirit's guidance is, is just all over it. Right. We can do nothing but, but represent Jesus to each other as we talk about perhaps some challenging things. And so, you know, as we go, I just, I just want to say, bro, thanks for being here today, man. Yeah. This was fun. Um, it's always good to engage you, Cap, and you stir me up in a great way. So, and <laughs> as you're doing it, so thanks. Well, I'm glad you agreed to do this, and I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm glad that um, we got a chance to. And I'm I'm really glad that we chose this book. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been so long since I've even looked at it, and I don't know if I've ever even really read it through carefully. Mm-hmm. It's funny as as we go through this webinar series, all the books now I'm 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 approaching with a much different mindset. I'm mm-hmm. now looking at them as to say, okay, what's going on? What? And I'm starting to understand my dad. <laughs> Talk about understanding people. Through all these books, I mean, it's funny because you talk with people similar to yourself. You've not met dad or very little, and, and but yet you know him because you know him through what he's saying. And by the way, what he's saying in this book is who he was. That's who he was. And so it just gives us all something to aspire to be. We've got that now, and we've got the same spirit of Jesus in us that he had in him. So we have the opportunity to have impact on people that is eternal. That to me is, it brings kind of the hair up on my neck a little bit. And that, man, the, the power that the spirit has yeah. through us. So I just appreciate you, bro. Anything else you want to say as we shut her down here, my man? I agree. It's, you know, I'm going to buy more copies because quite frankly, I have a big shelf. You can see back there a lot of books and I've moved up and I realized this is, this is for a very thoughtful person who wants to get a grounding in this and build off of it, quite frankly, because there's a lot of, if you're not grounded, right? all your thinking is going to be skewed. So I, I, I would recommend it. And I really enjoyed going back through it again. Yeah. And as you read it, you almost have to read them in tandem with scripture because right. he's, he's talking about Jeremiah, um, Colossians a lot. I mean, just all the, the passages that he's continuing to reference throughout these books. And I noticed this in this one. And I just really, that just reminds me of my dad. And I just, when I think of the Bible, I think of my dad. <laughs> awesome. Cause he had a love for the word. So thanks for joining us today, everybody. Evan, have a great day. Thank you, brother. Thanks.